Hi, Antonetta. How are you? Hi, how are you? It's nice to see you. This is such a good opportunity, I think, to talk about your you know, amazing film, which I believe is your first film, right? That's right. And about your amazing film, which is not your first film. But yeah, it's no. Well, look, I think there's so much to unpack with uh, Morina, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, that I don't think we need to talk much about The Way of Water, other than maybe to the extent that we both like to shoot underwater, clearly. So I guess yeah. I'll, I, I guess I would start off with that. You know, uh, obviously, shooting underwater is very difficult. Um, you you were making a film that's that's a that's a dr drama, basically a four character drama, and you you took on that added burden of filming underwater. Um, where does that where does the desire, the necessity to do that come from in your life? Are you a diver yourself? It always comes from fear. Everything, right? I think that <laughs> to to um, to create something with urgency and tension, you have to go from fear. So I'm terrified of water. Interesting. And as a child, I actually, I mean, I grew up on an island. I was always around the water. I had underwater my little um, spot where I would dive and pretend I could stay there forever. But um, I think somehow inevitably as you grow, you are more and more scared of a deeper spots, hidden spots, higher rocks to jump. And so developed my fear. And actually someone once told me I'm going to die in water. So I decided definitely that's where I'm going to shoot the first film. Uh, so that's, that's very bold and brave. Uh, so then, but you created a character in Yulia who's obviously you know, loves the water and, and it almost seems like that's her sacred place, her sanctuary away from, you know, all the drama and all the kind of oppression that she feels in her life. So you must have been channeling through your younger, less fearful self. Yes, I was, um, I was thinking a lot. I, first of all, uh, the character of Yulia, I really wrote for this actress that I discovered on my first short film that was also underwater. Uh, I felt she's really uh, special and she needs to be captured before she fully becomes a woman. So I wanted to catch that development around the time when she was 16, 17. Mm -hmm. And um, she's a professional swimmer and she had this resilience of somebody who is really determined to succeed and that was kind of the the seed of making creating that character uh she she's like a fish in the water the notes to her as an actress were like please swim less good it's too synchronized it can't be that good <laughs> <laughs> but um the water as a sanctuary I I know I knew when I was writing Morena that uh, it can't feel like a holiday place. It cannot be like no. a beautiful countryside. It had to to create this uh, tension. It had mm -hmm. to stark nature, almost in inhabitable, and croatia itself really is very beautiful so mm -hmm. that was a challenge actually to create claustrophobia in such a place so when looking for locations i was looking for um uh islands without trees without any shade where like people can right. really feel like flash burning yes and naturally the place to hide is underwater right but you can hide there for only as long. They didn't have all the creatures that could have helped them, like in your film. That's I loved that. Right. But uh, they they could have stayed there only um, as long as human breath uh, keeps them, and um, that therefore that was somehow a place uh, like hiding, but also impossible to survive and. It it really was somehow a subconscious of this. I was right going here. to say, yeah, yeah. Water, water. I think always can. We always connect with it in an almost a Jungian way. 
I yes. think, in terms of the subconscious, in terms of our our dream reality. It has it's simultaneously inviting and also scary, you know, and and alien. So I think that speaks to all the things. The only time she tips her hand, I think, in the film is when she says, I don't like not knowing what's underneath me. Yes. So it's like she has a fear of the of the deep, what's under her, until she goes there and she meets it at eye, at eye level, so to speak. I mean, isn't it like that always in life? Like going back to the reason why to confront water and confront your fears and confront uh, going into unknown that that is what we somehow lose with age i think is a uh, readiness to go into unknown we always resort into familiarity right and i i think that um as an artist as a director as a filmmaker as someone who is also bringing the courage to your audience and i really love that about your film is a you, you have to continue um exposing yourself you are gonna you're gonna be the one to jump in first before your actors you're gonna be the one to test the grounds and territory right because you're, you're leading your people there mm -hmm. you have a very important scene i think and the shots are quite studied or evocative where she's diving with cliff curtis yes, and it's her first actors. scuba yeah, right. We we share him in common and underwater. But he's taking her on her first scuba dive and they're going deeper and deeper. And the mother can't and she has to bail out. And it becomes very metaphorical for how she's willing to proceed into the unknown when the when the mother can't. And of course, sub, you know, the subtext there is it's really a potential relationship with this man and uh and so it, they're going deeper and deeper but it's also simultaneous it kind of reminded me of the scene in titanic when jack takes her to the bow of the ship and she sees how wonderful it is and shares what he's feeling you know i'm just using a a, a, a ready reference point which is he's sharing something with her there's a transfer of energy from him to her and the and the scuba mouthpiece is liberating her from that five minute and twenty second time limit, which is the best she's ever done on on breath hold. And I, I I thought that all was very very carefully you know thought out and structured and shot and even even holding the camera and letting them proceed through through frame, which is a very hard thing I think to do when you're underwater because it's point the camera at what's happening. You know, so I felt the hand of the director there versus the underwater camera camera person. Thank you, James. <laughs> I really appreciate this um, juxtapositions that you created. Titanic definitely was such a important film in my life. Actually, I think that's the only film I went to see with both of my parents. Mm, interesting. that scene you mentioned is that's exactly the feeling that it, it's true it's like that scene underwater between Yuli and Javi it's it's a feeling of the best is yet to come right right and opportunities are infinite and yes. it's somehow like Kantian sublime that it's both mathematical and mm -hmm. uh, feeling small in a world that is so much more bigger than you and mysterious the the presence of spirit and the soul and uh, i i try of course with a limited budget of morena uh, we had to compensate a lot with shots as you described but also we could have expanded that world through music that says there's so much more and that more is so big that music is so silent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. minimal really like uh, being in another universe right but you didn't go you didn't uh, go maximalist with the score there at all it's quite it's quite minimalist but somehow that uh, allowed me to stay connected to her and her emotion despite the scale of the of the shot and it also reminds me as we're talking about it that you play with scale right at the end when she's swimming and the mm -hmm. camera just pulls back and back and back and she becomes quite microscopic in the in the frame 
And but the yet, breath was so loud. Yeah, yeah. But I interpreted that as yes, yeah, she's very tiny in the in the world, but she's going to make her way. And it it also showed almost I don't want to say the hopelessness, but the challenge of being you know, all alone and having to get across this this great body of water. But I don't think anybody leaves the theater believing that she's not going to make it. She's going to make it because she's I determined. Really hope. I hope so. I remember when I wrote that last scene um, with my co-writer, it said she, there was nothing around her, nothing behind her and nothing in front of her, but we know right. she will arrive somewhere. Right. Yeah, exactly. She'll arrive. So she's all on her, on her own, and it's it's a self-imposed exile from the forces that were limiting her. Her father was limiting her. He was crushing her soul with practically everything he said throughout the film. The mother turns out to be less an ally than you originally thought and is exposed as part of that which is shackling her to that bare rock island. And at first she she tries to escape through a man as many women do in life men hold the power they can take they can take you out of your life change your existence all those things and she puts so much you know she puts so much um, onto that and then ultimately she's left with just herself and her decision to just swim just go Re I, I love I, you know symbolically I, I love i love that thank you Thank you. It is about yes. It's about um, it's about jumping off a high rock and hoping you land somewhere. Yeah, that's yeah. what I like about Curie also in your film. I, I was I actually struck with some similarities between our characters. You know, Yulia, she she is a bit withdrawn and doesn't interact with the with the people that that. Uh, she doesn't feel that she has power, but she does. There's a really interesting thing, and a casting is a critical part of it. You always feel her power, even though it's very inner, and and sometimes it's really just the power to endure, you know. Um, and she's also very conscious of power because she says to her mother, "If I had the power that you do, I would use it." And I think it's really interesting. She's not ro she's not romantic. She looks at the boys of summer and it's kind of interesting and it's but it's not her life and it's not who she is. I just wonder what your thought process was either in the in the writing or you were wrote it for this for this actress, right? That's an interesting question. I think that um it is a it is an age where you are not aware of your power. You you see power in other women, mm -hmm. real women fully blown mm. woman and you are thinking that that power is so far removed from you and hoping maybe one day you step into it but she's absolutely unaware of different power she has and this right. movie is about stepping into it as you said exactly uh it's about not mistaking your own power with the power that others can give you exactly never as strong yeah it always yeah. yeah and she makes an important decision in this film she's pointing the spear gun at her father and it's, it's the second time it happens because it happens at about the halfway mark of the film or a little a little past and then it happens again toward the toward the end and you think okay this time she's going to pull the trigger and there's a part of you that wants her to do it because he's been such a monster and of course there's a part of you the ethical part of you doesn't want her to do it because that will destroy her life. That will end her options, you know, and, and, that, she makes and, and that's something that moved me also in Avatar with Tiger. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. That, that was very, that was very moving. The, the relate, the law the, for me, all of Avatar is about love that one has for their children. Yeah. And it, and, and it translates from Navi to animals, to every single creature, humans, and finally AI. Mm -hmm. Right. And that was incredible. Like even something that does not have our uh, biological consciousness that is uh, connected to the body, but it's just a chip 
put in still holds the love of a right. parent towards a child. Right. And, and uh, you know, I, I think also that moment reminds us that the bonds of family are not necessarily the love, the bonds of love that we would choose for ourselves. They're yes. chosen for us. Yes. Right. And, and it's interesting, you know, the, in, in my film, it's extolled as a kind of a, a duty, but it's also a power and a strength. And in your film, it's actually uh, acting against your individual power or the, the Yulia's individual power, which she finally, she finally, even by having a choice to swim and possibly it's even suicidal, she doesn't care at that point. So she becomes, you know, this kind of almost blank slate in a kind of this existential void, which I, I like the symbology of using the ocean, you know, in a way that's simultaneously kind of welcoming, beautiful, transportive, dangerous, all of those things. It's kind of almost a metaphor for life or for existence. As you said in Avatar, water gives life. And, and connects water, all things. Connects right. all things. And that is such an important part of it as a full cycle. I was thinking, uh, I have to be honest, this morning um, I woke up uh, very early to watch Avatar again. Oh. Before, <laughs> and I remembered this very strange image. Uh, I was very, um, as a child, I think every child, you are concerned about death and when you die, if you're going to see your parents again. Right. And um, there was this image of they're laying the body in a, underwater and the right. wise. Uh, I don't know how to describe well, we could, Yeah, kind of like an anemone, uh, so, the tenderness yeah, of an anemone. Yeah. Big anemone. Are taking the body in. Um, and I remembered in that moment how my mom told me that when you die, you become a part of the one very long river that it's what, like a white soup. And mm -hmm. all the mm -hmm. souls are going together mm -hmm. and talk to each other. And I saw I, the white I saw the White River once in my life. It was a ceremony that they do in Hiroshima for the dead. And they light a single lantern, a, a candle in a paper lantern that's on a little wooden raft, and they put it in the river. And they wow. ring and they hit the gong. And then they light another one and they put it in the river and they hit the gong. And it goes on for about three hours. And by the end of the ceremony, there's 120,000 lanterns floating slowly down the river and it becomes a river of light that goes off as far as the eye can see it's the most moving thing i've ever seen in my life but it's it's literally made real in the world what your mother was talking about it's all the souls i, I don't think that she saw that but that's how she explained to me and it sounds terrifying for many years i have to tell you <laughs> but once i saw avatar this morning i found peace with that image well, f keep your fears close to you because they're ser serving you well creatively. Yes. Uh, now, do you do you uh, find some? Do you find that you move through your fear by realizing it in your film? I think so. I think that um, for a very long time, I had almost like a little ghost behind me before I made the Morena. And once I made it, that was released. Mm, mm, interesting. I, I don't know how to explain that. This is very odd, but um, it was something that was definitely not holding me back, not pushing me. It was just like parallel thing with me. And um, with Morena, that person or spirit was gone. Uh, it, it, it had the life of its own. And I, I, I'm now going on to another fear. <laughs> yeah right exactly well every every film is a personal journey i remember i used to have a, a nightmare a recurring nightmare over and over several times a year of a giant wave that was coming toward the shore and there wasn't time to get away and no matter how fast you climbed mm -hmm. and you'd see it hitting behind you and coming up and i had many many versions of that dream over the years and then i made the abyss 
in uh, 1988 and in it there's a giant wave sequence where I was processing that that image and in the movie the wave almost hits but then it stops and this is in the special edition because we took the wave scene out which maybe also has some psychological uh, interpretation and then the wave recedes and it goes back it's stopped by a by a higher force uh, it's caused by a higher force and then it's stopped by that same higher in intelligence and um, I never had the dream again after that's that incredible. and yeah, what was so, the fear, what was the fear or the 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 force behind it, this avatar the way yeah, in, in this avatar um well obviously i think it's just my you know my gnawing concern for the state of our world and what we're losing you know the the beauty and the complexity and diversity of nature that we're systematically destroying so and we're all a part of it to one degree or other. I mean, I try to live with the lightest possible footprint I can, but I've got a lot of things that I like to do that are energy intensive, like filmmaking and so on. You know, so we're all we're all a part of it and we have to learn to live differently. And I think the best way to get people to think about these things is not by beating them over the head or make the, making them feel guilty. I think the uh, avatar asks you to kind of step outside yourself and become a Navi and look back at the human race through their eyes, which is really just another state of consciousness for us as humans. You know, we project yes. ourselves, you know, the Navi represent kind of our indigenous better selves, you know, who did live in harmony with this planet for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. It's only in the last few thousand years that it's gotten, you know, way out of balance also thinking about this morning what was really one of the most moving things for me is this relationship between mothers different mothers in the movie and their children and those screams and that's something that it's so universal in every culture and in every time and that was really shattering yeah uh, yeah you're talking about Neytiri's reaction when when she sees her son has died also, Kate Winslet's over a whale. Yes, exactly. Her scream, her scream for uh, for her dead sister, who happens to be of a different species. Yeah. So, look, I mean, I you know, I don't know if I was a female in a past life, but I do feel that that I'm attract, I'm I'm drawn to stories of that that female power, that female energy, which, and I think i only feel more so now not just because i've had you know success telling those stories but because i think that we as the human race it's the it's the masculine directive that had to to conquer and to control that has put us in the dilemma that we're in and we need more of that sort of gaia you know goddess kind of kind of you know pagan you know kind of connection to nature that that is more of a female spirit um you know, we've we've had enough conquest to last us for a while, I think, you know, we have the pendulum has to swing the other direction, which is one of the things I'm trying to tap into. Now, there are a lot of a lot of people, you know, who would say, well, you've got no business writing this stuff because you're not a you're not a woman, but. But I'm, you're a creator and women are creators. Right, exactly. of, life, of films. Yeah. yeah, that 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 is the, the creation side. I think that, you know, putting putting the shoe on the other foot, you've created a very interesting male character with uh, Javi, right? Cliff Curtis. He's he's a very he's a very complex guy. He's he's he, he's on the one hand, you're told by the magazine cover that he's this ruthless icon and you could see that in his business life, he's an alpha dog, you know, but he's actually quite kind and generous with her. And he kind of is the father she wished she'd had. And then an interesting kind of Freudian transference takes place that actually becomes a direct attraction, you know, romantic, sexual exchange of power, whatever, whatever it is. So there's a whole complex thing going on with both of those characters. Yeah, I, I've, I really had a lot of fun writing those um male characters because uh, both their ruthlessness and their generosity comes from uh, fear. Uh, right. I, I, I really um, 
felt that Javi's Cliff Curtis character has so much power in a world outside of this island. And in this island, what was attractive to him was vulnerability, was the lack of certain power because his value is different. It's of course his his uh, uh, financial power remains the same, but he cannot buy everything with it. And that's yeah, I have to, I have to say I did I did watch the film again, and and uh, I noticed something I hadn't noticed in the first viewing, which is that when he's off, he's way off in the distance arguing on the phone. He says, "Stop using our children as a weapon between us," and. I had sort of missed that line because I thought he was just off kind of arguing with some business attorneys or something like that. And I realized, of course, he's talking to his wife and they're either separating or or divorcing or whatever it is. And so he's actually a free ball. He's actually in play. If Yulia's mother had made the move, that was a possibility, I think. Power is hers. The power is hers, definitely. Yeah, yeah, it was there. And the other thing is that struck me, the film is, Almost every shot is on either Yulia or what she's seeing. It's either on her, then on something, or or over her to the something. There's almost, I don't think there's anything that happens in the film, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that's outside of her subjective experience. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I see these these really- Except the last shot. The, except the last shot, exactly, where we become the audience again, right? Instead of instead of seeing it through through her or God, right? But I think that I'm not I'm not religious personally, so I say okay, she's she's cast herself into the to the the hands of the ocean to decide her fate. But it's not. But that's not even really accurate because she's swimming. She has purpose. She's not drifting. She she's 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 swimming ahead. She's going. She, she's she's propelling, and that. Yes. Spirit that has released me goes right. away. That yeah. uh, shot it goes from me to the to Yuli in a movie. It's now watching over her. I think that's what it is. Now I just came, I just came to realization of this as we speak. Right. But I so- I want to go back to spirituality because I felt that so many messages you packed into Avatar to approach it to the audience that maybe necessarily would not go to experience sublime and spirituality and a nature and a connect being connected to the nature. Um, but they go. Well, they it's, go. it's a tricky, it's a tricky thing because, you know, the goals of the two films are, are a bit different because obviously Either of the Avatar films are meant to be adventures and meant to have action and spectacle and wonder and all that sort of thing. And um, so you're serving, you're sort of serving two masters. One is the inward, you know, and, and, you know, trying to make a comment on people, their relationships and their relationship with nature, with, with existence, you know, with balance, all that. And at the same time, you know, running around blowing shit up. <laughs> you know, so it, it's sometimes a little bit of an uneasy, uh, uh, you know, uneasy juxtaposition that, that, you know, one tries to navigate. So I would say that, you know, I'm looking at your film, I see a purity of, of purpose there, which, which I admire and, and respect. So, um, and I think, and I think you mentioned score, the score is quite almost a steer, but it's, but it's quite moving in uh in places simply because it persists in that in that you know austerity until uh right until the end which i which i quite like there's a lot so your film has has been very well recognized as as i recall i think uh um you've won a number of awards with it what's what's that like coming coming right out of the gate into the into the critical world and being being celebrated a uh, uh, hard work. <laughs> uh, right. Um, well, honestly, um, for, first of all, it's very encouraging. It feels good that the audience 
likes the movie that connects to it that you feel you've touched someone um it also feels res I, I feel a lot of responsibility for what i'm doing next i was just about to say does this create a new fear for your next film i mean i think that i don't know i don't know if the fear ever leaves you but i do have a new fear definitely and that's that is i became a mother on a on 12 hours before i received camera door in can and <laughs> um, and and what i related to is you know happiness is simple but it can right leave you keep in any simple. moment yeah yeah keep it simple and, what uh, what of those two things is more important right yes, that's ultimately but, but the biggest the question both, both creations are important, but it's always life feeds the film. Exactly. So when, I, when I'm writing right now and preparing my next film, that is definitely informing my new fears. That's why I could sit at the edge of my seat watching Avatar, because it's all about <laughs> those children, one right. way or the other. Right. Well, look, the great... The great um equipoise that every artist and certainly film directors have to solve for themselves is family and the responsibility of of that and one's art and you know i think there's a very interesting scene in the fablemans in steven spielberg's film where you know judd hirsch's character does a whole monologue about two pages on that and how difficult it is and that's obviously steven working out his stuff you know, when you get when you get to my position and you've been doing it for 40 years and you look back over the times when you've sacrificed a personal life for the work. And yet what you just said is critical, which is the the work must feed on something on some life experience. So you have to try both. And I I look at so many um, I see I see actors, I see directors who remain they don't have families. They don't embrace that. They stay the lone wolf. And there's there's a limit to what they can say about the human condition, not having been parents. Or, or even just um, stepping out of the bubble of one's, um, you know, soul drive towards certain goal is yes. so important for having, having to experience life truly right. to, to speak. Right. Uh, that that is very important. It's all a balance, of course. Um, we are living in a highly unbalanced world. So to find that um, sanctuary that is both uh, feeding your creative brain and nurturing your soul and giving you perspective on things and what, what matters, what is entertaining, but yet, uh, yet nurturing and yet uh, guiding the new generations into the better world while maintaining right. entertainment right. is uh, all comes i think also from life experience and and being in the world to say these right. things it's interesting to see you you know i would say closer to the beginning of your career me closer to the end of my career 40 years sort of between us in that regard and you know, trying to remember what it was like for me to have that confidence to believe that I actually had something to say that people might care about, you know, and you obviously have like? that, have that confidence. Tell and me, what was it like? I want to know. <laughs> I don't know. I just remember when I was writing The Terminator, I used to, I used to write all night and sometimes I'd just go out and drive around the empty streets, especially if it was raining, where I could get into that kind of film noir, taxi driver kind of feeling of, of, of com you know, complete isolation from humanity. And I'd go to an all-night diner like Dupar's restaurant on Ventura Boulevard, and I'd just stake out a booth, and I'd just sit there and, and write for a couple of hours, and the waitresses would just keep bringing the, the coffee, you know. And uh, I, I just realized that I was kind of, you know, I was angry. I was probably working. I don't know if I would call it fear, more angst, more just existential <laughs> angst, you know? Yeah. So you were a method. You were a method director coming from <laughs> yeah. the mood yeah. while writing. 
That's right. Creative mood. Yeah. Method, method writing. <laughs> well, where were, you, where were you in your life as you were writing uh, Morina? Oh, actually, I relate to that. Angst is a very good word because you are really not, um, you can dream of being director and you can dream of moving people, but you, you really are not until you do. And, um, that that is a, a certain engine that that is that angst of um of needing to be on the field and doing it instead of just reading user manuals like right exactly studying uh uh you have to uh, I, i'm sure that jung has to move from the books as well and uh, dig into uh, humans so 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 that's director you need those it was an angst until you come on set and you see um, your uh, humans physically manifesting those words and uh, people moving and uh, giving an energy and blood and tears and creating this uh, totem of magic that later in a cinema, others are watching your, your they watch your spell uh, acted out in a... Right totem of a witchcraft and they're they're moved and change as if through an object of magic that's that that take to create that and to push through that takes the angst uh takes the fear and takes those tears and blood and i, I i'm i'm sure you go through it still do you after 40 years well, look, I think there's always this feeling in the back of your mind that somebody's going to come up and tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, you're here by mistake. Get out of here. You know, oh when you God. see all these resources around you and, and you think it's all there to 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 manifest something that that you've written. But I think that the 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 answer to it is innate, which you which is you've written it. You are a writer. You, you know, Antonetta are a writer director. So you imagined it. You, you willed these people into a kind of half-life on the page and then you hand it to the actors and then you see it brought to life. And at that moment, it kind of doesn't even really matter what happens next because you're there oh. and, and in that moment, they're bringing it to life. They are those people now. They are those people and they create uh, relationships right there that are out of your... Um, you can you can merely guide them, but the real energy that comes out is uh, it depends on these people manifesting it. But did anyone ever tell you you are here by mistake? Because it happened. <laughs> no, it's but cool. I, it's it's a it's a uh, it's just a uh, a kind of you know abstract fear. I think you know just I'm just flashing through images in the film. I'm just kind of going through composition. There's so many nice things that that you did, and I'm curious how much of it just kind of pops into existence in front of your eyes, and how much of it did you sort of storyboard out? And I'm going to give you an oh. example. There's a moment where she's confronting her mother and the father comes and sits down and the mother turns away. The father basically limits her and says, you will be a prisoner. And the mother reaches out and takes the, and the father's gripping her like, you know, the controlling. And then he reaches out and, and the mother and the father join hands and you realize she's doomed because the mother has now bought in, is no longer her ally, but has, has, has turned away from her and has and is now in a solidarity. She's defeated and she's accepted her role. And it's just a very simple composition. And luck. You think luck is a factor there that you saw something and went for it or that the actors just did that and you went, holy shit. Oh, no, I have to say, I, I, I'm a person who prepares everything and draws everything out. Um, Good. And the reason why I do is because I don't write the first idea of the script and go to shoot it. You know, you shoot your fifth, sixth, seventh idea. So why would I do the same with shots? Like it's writing with images. Like no one shoots the okay. first draft. This is what I this is what I imagine to be true. I, I just wanted to confirm it because I think there are a lot of directors that just let a lot of things happen in front of the lens and sort it all out later. They shoot with multiple cameras. They just let the actors sort of go off. But there was a precision 
in in the shot design and in what the people within the frame were doing that was never i thought obtrusive or showy in fact some of the things i didn't even notice on first viewing but then later realized how important they were and i do think that communi films communicate consciously and subconsciously sim simultaneously on on multi levels so i'm glad to see that that's something that you're you're imagining that frame in advance and 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 guiding it into existence it's 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 really about being as simple as possible and using as few tools as you can otherwise it's a tool on top of the tool is a repetition so for me it was really to um you know putting all the emotion in but then like really streamlining it like what what music speaks the sound design doesn't and the dialogue doesn't and the what 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 picture says all these other elements have to be toned down right. so one one tool actually because you are very spare with using tools that means you are using all of them somehow. right right because you are trying to be as lean as possible right so the audience follows emotion yeah so you know you have to know every single tool so that you can reject 99 percent of them and choose the one right there are that infinite you... options yeah yeah and the yeah. and the sun's going down yes <laughs> <laughs> somehow somehow and we're, the we're... and yeah. there's waves and their tourists there's always things there there's all we are always working with nature we are not we are very rarely in a studio maybe right. not actually we are sometimes in a studio but there are other op there there are other problems there yeah. so well so uh, the way of water exists at the exact opposite end of the spectrum of that because when we capture the essence of the perform we capture the performance but then we have an infinite number of options in terms of how we light it, whether it's night or day, late sun, mid sun, shade, waves, no waves, all of those things can all be added later. So I don't know if that's me just responding to all of those couple of early decades of being at the whims of, of nature and happenstance, um, or and, and that's why I gravitate to it because I can just focus on the actors you know, when, I, when I'm doing that, and then I can worry about all that other stuff later. But what I've found is that when you have an infinity of options in, in every aspect of cinematography and editing, it's never out of focus, you know, that sort of thing. Um, what you find is that you, it's actually harder because you have That's to be much I, more I wanted to ask, how do, you, how do you choose? Because the spaces in your film in all of your films, but now speaking of the way of water is so much informing the characters. It's informing the world, it's forming, informing what could be lost. It's informing the intimacy as well. The right. way they meet, um, the, the, the space uh, also informs really like spirituality, proximity to death, to danger. Right. How do you make those choices when they all have to come from imagination? How do you create those spaces? Where, where do you start from? Right. Well, because you're not, I mean, when you're on location with actors and you, you're shooting from instinct very often, and then you look at it all later and you find that which sitting in dailies, seeing it projected or, or at the, at the avid moves you or affects you and then you start juxtaposing things and with an avatar film you could you're still at a blank slate after you've got the performances so when yeah. why do i want to be in that close-up and is it better for me to relate that character to another character in this frame or do i come out wider and as you say make the environment inform you know the the conflict or the tension or or whatever it is the spiritual connection so i think I'm not sure I could have made an Avatar film as my first movie. I had to go through that real world live action, holding the camera on my shoulder, being out there, you know, and and then apply that uh, later. So I think e even if one winds up doing this kind of, you know, VFX heavy stuff, you still have to go through that part of the life cycle, um, I, I think. But I, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that you 
you draw it out, that you imagine the frame, you imagine the configuration of the characters in advance. Because I really think that's, it. Re first of all, it really shows in the film. The, okay. there's, there's, no, there's no wasted shot or composition in the film. Everything is advancing an idea. Uh, at least that, that was my, my feeling about the, the film. Um, I really admire the film. And I think that the, the, much, the accolades the accolades that you've received for it are are uh, are well earned. Thank you, and I really admire your film. And the box office is definitely speak <laughs> of it. Well, I, <laughs> you know, I, well. well, I I feel like it's an interesting metric. We can literally look sort of culture by culture, territory by territory. We're going across cultural boundaries, language boundaries, and that sort of thing, and seeing where people are responding. And then in some, sometimes you're able to sort of map it back. Okay, we're very big in Korea. Koreans really care about family dynamics and generational things. Same in China. You know, it's, it's like, okay, some places I get it, other places I don't. It's a bit mysterious, you know, but that's kind of cool too, because it's a way, like artists, you know, I mean, look, we can say we just put our stuff out there and we don't care, but I think we do care. We care. We care to get some kind of feedback, negative or positive, you know, that an idea that we had that we manifested in, into the world has resonated with somebody somewhere in some meaningful way. Yes, no, we definitely care. We, we otherwise we would not make those very laborious work that takes sleepless nights and a lot of uh, life force right. and uh, if we, and we are not making it for ourselves we are making it for audience to connect to it because i know exactly what my movie looks like before i shoot it i don't have to go out there and shoot it for me <laughs> i do it for others to experience that i, I and so do I think that's manifest. I think that's that's absolutely clear from the film itself. Well, look, I think we've we've touched on a lot of really interesting things, Good. and and uh, you know, I think we should probably wrap this up. But yes. um, I, I think it's it's uh, it's first of all, it's always interesting to talk to other filmmakers. We tend to be these kind of insular creatures, these kind of lone wolves, you know. Uh, with our own little kind of pyramidal, you know, creative teams around us. But I do think it's it's critical to to you know share insights. Um, and I'd, I'll, you know, I guess I'll just I'll just I'm, you can wrap this up if you like. Uh, this you. is kind of this is kind of your thing. So why, why don't I hand it to you? Thank you, thank you very much for uh, giving me your time. And this is not the first time we talk. And Every time it has been a pleasure. I feel like I've learned each time and I got energy for the next steps as I'm building my own um, stories and hoping my audience connects to them as well. And I'm very grateful to you and I wish you amazing avatars to follow. I'm going to be watching them. <laughs> okay. I'll be well, sharing I'll my forward... movies with you. Yeah, thank you. And I look forward to seeing what you're going to make next, your next story. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.